Memphis has won eight in a row as of this recording, two of which have come with Ja Morant as the team's bodyguard. The Grizz have recorded 115 points in eight straight games, the longest streak by any team this year. After Morant stated in an interview with ESPN's Malika Andrews, quote unquote, I'm fine in the West a few weeks ago, the Grizz evidently want all the smoke. However, that statement seemed to backfire initially when Golden State annihilated them on Christmas Day without Curry and Wiggins. Putting that happenstance off night amidst the 82 game grind aside though, Memphis's mind boggling physical specimen in terms of his Bulls Derrick Rose type bunnies for a point guard may not be the quiet type like D Rose, but Morant's flair for the dramatic and undeniable ability to lead a 15-man unit on and off the court with his leadership to keep the vibes right are all qualities at a championship caliber level. However, while a couple of the Grizzlies' wins amidst their current streak have come without Morant, whether or not the rest of the Grizzlies can back up Morant's claims of being fine in the West is another story. In response to the Malika interview, Draymond stated on his podcast, quote, you are fine, Jaw. The Grizzlies, on the other hand, end quote. Memphis is tied for the first seed out west halfway through the season, fueled by Morant, Triple J, and Bain. The Kiwi Steven Adams doesn't get nearly enough credit for the dirty work he provides with his rebounding and defense. As I heavily broke down in this video right here, the Grizz are going to be a major threat to win it all. This video breaks down why they want all the smoke, but better be ready for what's to come in the postseason. Right quick, join the 10.2% of you watching that are subscribed by subscribing and turning on notifications, plus leave a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. Thank you for your support. Ja gets an over-the-top amount of flack for his perceived traveling violations as the travels that are called nowadays were never an issue in the Allen Iverson, Kobe Bryant era. Morant did get away with this travel, which he called himself out for on Twitter, and I get you have people nowadays trying to label everything as a carry or a travel. Personally, I just think the nuanced AI-type blend of speed and momentum crosses in Jaw's bag, while they aren't fundamental, should be appreciated for how utterly natural he makes them look. Morant just threw down his second all-time great poster on Jakob Pertl in the midst of his NBA 8th most 8th 35-plus point scoring performance. Over his first two career playoff appearances, and aside from a five-game series exit to D. Mitch and the Utah Jazz in 2021's first round, where Ja was still efficient, there's been little to no blips in Morant's young postseason legacy. Before getting hurt against Golden State last year in the conference semis, he was averaging 38.3 points per game in that series, as this man Morant has a Kobe Bryant-esque killer mentality to bring his game to a new level when the stakes are at their highest. Everything about Morant this year and what he's displayed so far throughout his time in the association defines superstar caliber. But regarding his bold claims that no one can touch Memphis in the West, can Morant's supporting cast take enough pressure off him to the point where he has all the stamina and health to come through when it matters most? Like, will Jaron Jackson's DPOY-esque production in terms of his lateral quicks, rim protection, and overall versatility be there against the most floor spacing prominent lineups in the playoffs. Steven Adams is a guy that's going to thrive when you have to face low post monsters like Kevon Looney, DeAndre Ayton, or Nikola Jokic, as the Kiwi fills out the role of old school center. For Jackson Jr., though, despite being 7'1, he's tasked with the role of being the modern day floor spacing quick twitch backside center who can guard positions 1 through 5. That's tough as a guy who's 7'1. The Warriors' offense proved to be a bit challenging for Jackson Jr. in round 2 last year in terms of him maintaining his versatility. That said, so far in 22-23, Triple J's been one of, if not the most versatile center, and over the years, he's proved himself as one of the most intriguing defenders and two-way five men in the association with his ground coverage, timing, and lengthy wingspan defensively, plus pick-and-pop ability and general three-point shooting offensively. He's been limited to just 25 games since he came back from being out four to six months after stress fracture surgery in his right foot, so he doesn't qualify for the blocks per game lead, but just over a quarter of the season is a massive sample size in which has seen Jackson average a monster 3.2 blocks per night, that's the most in the NBA by a good amount. The beastliness on the backside from Jaren is most evident though in the block per minute stats. In this category, among players who've suited up for at least 20 games, the gap between the number one ranked Jackson Jr. and Phoenix's number two ranked Biombo is the same gap between Bismack and the number 14 ranked Mitchell Robinson. Jackson Jr. is also seventh just behind Evan Mobley for the most contested shots per game. 
In terms of the other center for this team, Steven Adams, yeah, I'm a big Boston, man. he leads Memphis by far in rebounds per game, and he's also the qualified leader for this team in blocks per game. Of course, Jaron doesn't have enough games, but right behind teammate Dylan Brooks, Steven Adams ranks 8th across the NBA in plus minus. As you can tell, the 29-year-old product of Pittsburgh from New Zealand is in the prime of his career. The bruising, screen-setting primary finisher is a crucial contributor to Memphis's success. Further breaking down the intuitive old-school approach to the modern game from Steven Adams is definitely a film room breakdown I could make for a future video. I also have a lot of separate facts on Adams that I have to tell you about, subscribe for that. But let's talk about the product of TCU, whose astounding development over the years has been a focal point to Memphis currently being second in the West. Desmond Bain is this team's third leading bucket getter, who like Adams, is criminally underrated. Reason Desmond defines that term, underrated, is the fact that he's averaging the quietest 21.3 points per night across the NBA. Bain's historically been known as an efficient score rather than a volume score. His points per game fell from 23.5 in last year's first round to 14 in round two, but he never shot less than 48.5% from three-point range in either of those two rounds. Primarily, Desmond's a spot-up three-point marksman. However, last season, the biggest development in Bain's repertoire was his shooting off the dribble. Two years ago, during his rookie campaign in 2021, Desmond didn't even average a single three-point shot attempted off the dribble per game. That improved to 1.73s attempted per night off the dribble in 21-22's campaign, in which he made 44.4% of. But the biggest development in Desmond's game this year has been his passing, which is going to be an evident pressure relief off the likes of Ja Morant and Ty Jones in the 2023 postseason. Bain's four assists per night is a 1.3 increase from his sophomore campaign, and he's coming off a nine assist showing against Utah, where he picked apart the Jazz defense with either slick drop-offs to the paint, kickouts to the perimeter as the pick-and-roll ball handler, timely swings on the fast break, or well-orchestrated dribble handoffs. Against the other four of the top five teams in the West, being Denver, New Orleans, Sacramento, and Dallas, Memphis has a combined record of 4-4, four four, tied with the Pelicans for the second best record in those matchups behind the number one ranked Mavericks. But the scariest part about the Grizzlies is the big three of Morant, Jackson Jr., and Bain have missed a combined 47 games, yet the grinded out Grizz 2.0 rank at the top of the West with the playoffs just a few months away. Still, Jaw's comments leave an undeniable target on Memphis's back, which could either be a good or a bad thing. It could work to motivate them to try and back up those claims, or it could significantly motivate other teams like you may be seeing with New Orleans or Denver right now. What's the best or worst part about the Grizzlies in your opinion? Best answer down below in the comments gets next video shout out, and the top 5 commenters by March 21st earn free merchandise of their choosing. Today's speaks winner is Boston Haltane, who says without KD, the man who has to step up the most is the obvious answer, Kyrie Irving. Kyrie needs to take the responsibilities of the Nets number one option on offense and be an on-court leader. He needs to give energy on defense and inspire his teammates. When watching the Nets games, Brooklyn seems to be much more involved and determined to play hard on defense when they see the stars on their team putting in work to stay on their opponent, play help, and rebound. KD has been playing like an MVP, and his loss will hurt the Nets, but if Kyrie can step into the number one role and be a vocal leader and role model to his teammates, then Brooklyn will continue to win games. Appreciate Boston for the great take as always. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.